Welcome to Prophetic Nights with Prophet Petrus. Today's message, how to speak to God face to face. Well, we all know that we are at the end of the age. The rapture will happen in our lifetimes. A lot of people around the world say we have four to nine years left. Last year, men and women that have been in ministry the entire life without scandal, with a reputation for hearing God accurately, were praying to ask God how much time we have left. And unanimously, the reply came five to ten years. Five to ten years. But that was last year. And so that means we have four to nine years left. So why is that important? Well, we know at the end, just before the rapture, terrible times will come. Jesus said there will be war and rumors of war and that there will be great persecution of the church. And so how many of you realize that that means we are in shark-infested waters? I don't know about you, but I want all the help I can get to navigate those waters. And so it is more important than ever before that we are friends of God, that we know him and that we meet the criteria for him to speak to us face to face because he's going to be the only one that can help us navigate those shark infested waters this terrible time that we are living in many christians have neglected this responsibility as i'm in the prophetic and my wife is in the prophetic the number one question that we hear from people is prophet what is god saying yeah but you should be hearing God yourself. And so Satan attacks the gift on your life. In my life, I had to hear God and I had to hear God accurately. So that was the thing that Satan attacked. And so God took me on a journey that I not only hear him speak to me, but that he speaks to me face to face. And I'm not special, not because I'm a prophet that God speaks to me face to face. God can speak to anyone face to face so let's jump in and look at some tips that you can have a deeper intimacy with god that he speaks to you face to face number one you need to live holy hebrews 12 14 says make every effort to live in peace with one another and to be holy because without holiness no one will see the lord now this could be interpreted two ways you will not see god on the earth if you don't live holy but you will also not see him in eternity if you don't live only. Why? God hates sin. God hates sin. And God will not associate with the thing that he hates. So why does God hate sin so much? People don't understand the reason God created us. And this might shock some of you. is because God was lonely. God wanted a family. And there was nothing in all of creation comparable to him. And so, God put his own DNA in his creation that we share his attributes so that he can have a family. Satan, the father of sin, is trying to kill and take to hell as many of God's creation as he can. And so, God will not partner with that because sin is stealing his creation to separate or separation between him and his creation in hell. And so it is very important to understand without holiness, no one will see the Lord. So we have to live holy in order to attain heaven, but we also have to live holy to attract God to us. So God cannot come close to your sin because it can kill you. Why? Sin cannot exist in God's presence. And so if you were to have sin in your life and God would make himself manifest in his full presence, you would die. That is also why Adam was not allowed into heaven until Jesus paid the price so that his sin could be forgiven, so that he could be made righteous, so that he could gain access to heaven. That's why people lived in Abraham's bosom in Abraham's bosom, outside of heaven, until Jesus made atonement with the blood. So, in God's presence, sin cannot exist. And so, 
if you were to enter God's presence while you were in your sinful state, you would die. As I 59 2 says, but your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have made, uh, have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. And so it is, it, we have to realize that it's not that God doesn't love you, it is that sin causes separation between why God created us, between his creation and him. And we can't exist in God's presence with sin. Sin cannot exist in his presence. And so we have to live holy. It's not just a book of rules. That's the wrong way to think about it. You know, Satan would want to make this a legalistic issue to tell you, you're not allowed to do it because God, because God wants to control you. Or God wants to be all powerful. Or he wants to make the rules. It's not, it's not about rules. That's the wrong approach. That's exactly the way Satan wants this to look. It's, it's bigger than that. It is because separation is caused between God and his creation. And in God's presence, sin cannot exist. So, number one, we have to live holy. Now, we don't start our journey as being holy. It's progressive. But every day must be a little bit more holy than the day before. If, if, if it's not a progressive journey where I'm living more and more holy every day, then I'm backsliding. Then I'm backsliding. I cannot be stagnant or moving backwards. It must be an ever-continuing progressive journey forward, going from glory to glory as I'm being made holy, being made, be, uh, being sanctified. Right. So we must be set apart. We do not look and act and sound like the world. Romans 12. To do not conform to the patterns of this world, Thessalonians 4, 7. For God did not call us to be impure, but to live a holy life. 2 Corinthians 6, 17. Come out from them and be separate, says the Lord. Touch no unclean thing, and I will receive you. What is the unclean thing? Sin. Hebrews 10, 26 says, For if we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sin which means you cannot be made righteous. So I'd just like to point out, it is shocking when I look at Christians today that unless they tell me they're a Christian, I can't distinguish them from the world. They look, talk, and act and sound like the world. I know pastors on the stage that are tattooed from their toenails to their eyeballs. I don't see Jesus wearing any tattoos. And the Bible says, do not get tattooed, which we will make a whole teaching for another day. But let me tell you, getting a tattoo is publicly not correct. It's, it, it's a sin. I know some Christians that drink and smoke, and they say, no, I, I'm, I'm okay. I'm going to go to heaven. I accepted Christ. I know Christians that swear. And so the Bible is very clear. Romans 12, 2, do not conform to the pattern of this world. So Satan, the God of this world, has a pattern for this world. He wants everybody to watch Hollywood movies. He wants everybody to sleep around. He wants everybody not to be married. He wants everybody to have tattoos and piercings. And we're going to do a wonderful course on that that shows that it has occultic roots and the demon possession that tattoos and piercings bring. But that's for another day. And so... There is a pattern of this world that is by Satan's design. And God says, 2 Corinthians 6, 17, come out from them and be separate. Touch no unclean thing. Yet Christians like to blur the boundary lines and have one foot in the church and one foot in the world. That's a very dangerous place to be because sin ultimately causes God's creation to be separated from him for eternity in hell. And so God will not partner with sin. You might be entertaining the devil. And he'll be okay for you to play church on Sunday. But God is not okay with you entertaining the devil. Think about it this way. If two people get married, biblically now, how would the partner feel if one of the spouse goes and prostitutes themselves to someone else? But that's how God feels when we mix with the pattern of this world, when we're not separate and set apart and holy. 
And so God has a problem with people that are living in the world and in the church. In fact, in the book of Revelation, it says, because you were lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. Those are very strong words. We have to understand, God does not want us to mix with the world. And God wants us to be separate, not to try and prevent us legalistically, but because he's jealous for us. He sent his only son to die for us. He does not want us to partake with the lawless one that's only purpose is to steal, kill, and destroy. And so therefore, we have to live holy. I've given this illustration before, but let me go through it again. If the president come, comes and eats at your house, you're not going to give him the dog bowl to eat out of. Why? Because it's not good enough. You're going to take your bone china off the wall and give him out of a plate that nobody's ever been eating out of before. You're going to give your very best. Well, that's what God wants us to be separate. When we mix with the world, we dirty ourselves like the dog's bowl. And then we want the creator to fellowship with that dog's bowl. It will never work. It will never happen. And that is why God says, be separate. Don't conform to the pattern of the world. Come out from them and be separate. It is, yes, we are in the world, but we're not meant to look, act, talk, and sound like the world. This is a very big problem. And so in your weakness, if there's something that you're doing that's, that's not holy, Ask God to help you. Ask the Holy Spirit to help you. Repent and say sorry and say, God, I want to turn away from this thing. Give me the strength and he will help you. He will come and rescue you. God is jealous and he will not share you. Exodus 25, for I, the Lord, your God, am a jealous God. When you are sinning or spending time with the devil or time in the world, it is like the prostitute crying then. You're prosti prostituting yourself to sin. And then expecting God to be intimate with you. Now, I just want to tell you something. It's not in the notes. The Bible says God knew Adam in the cool of the day. And it also says Adam knew his wife. That word know is the same in the original Hebrew. What does that mean? The same word where God knew Adam is the same word how Adam slept with his wife had intercourse. And so what does that mean? They are interchangeable. And so intimacy between a man and a wife is the intimacy that God wants. And so when a man marries a wife, he would not be pleased if that wife is sleeping around and then tries to sleep with him again. It's an abomination. And God is the same. God will not share you with your sin. So you have to live holy. You have to be separate, set apart. We must not look, act, think, talk, sound like the world because then we are promoting the devil's agenda. We're telling other people, hey, it's okay to sin. Don't worry. Going to hell is not a problem. That's what we are saying. Deuteronomy 4.24, for the Lord your God is a consuming fire, a jealous God. Josh, a jealous, uh, God. Joshua 24.19, he is a holy God. He is a jealous God. Now, holy and jealous is interchangeable. Why? Because God doesn't share. Like a man that marries his bride, he's not going to let the whole world sleep with his bride. That's an abomination. And so if the bride only sleeps with her husband, she is then holy to her husband because only he has access. That's what God wants. God wants to be the only one that has access to us. So every time we drink, we smoke, we get a tattoo, we use foul language, we get a piercing, we're sleeping in sin, we give the devil access. And God's not going to mix the two because he's jealous. Then the second part, you have to have faith. You have to have faith. Why? Because without faith, it is impossible to please God. And also with faith, you access the supernatural. The spirit realm. Now God is spirit. And so if you don't have faith, you won't be able to access that realm. Your spirit won't be able to communicate to God's spirit. And so you have to have faith. Now, people don't understand fear negates faith. There could be many types of fear. It is strange to me that a child is born without fear, 
but just after six short years, the parents have installed fear. I've seen one and two years old, one and two year olds want to climb a tree, stand on a high chair, not, not scared of heights. And then the parents said, don't do that, you're going to fall, that's too high. And then at age six, you try and put them on something high, now they're afraid because we've installed fear into them. It's not godly. It's not godly. Children are born without fear. They'll pick up the snake, they'll play with this, the spider, they'll want to put their fingers into the, the electrical outlet, they'll climb the tree, they have no fear. And then our parents, through ignorance, install fear into us. But that's not the only fear. We also have fear of man, fear of horror movies, fear from things, heights, phobias that our parents installed in us. People don't understand horror movies creates fear. That's why it's so popular, especially in the area where we now live in. Satan is, has this worldwide movement where there's been an explosion in horror movies. Why? Because he's trying to diminish the faith. Jesus said, when I return, will I find faith in the earth? Saying that our faith is going to come under attack. But this is the season we're now living. Very few people have faith and they don't understand fear left unchecked in your life is going to negate your faith. What does that mean? It's the opposite of faith. Fear is the opposite of faith. Why are you fearful, O you of little faith? Matthew 8, 26. So if you're watching horror movies, you need to stop. And if you have fear in your life, you need to find a scripture that's the opposite of that fear. Then you need to memorize it. You need to repeat it. You need to say it every day. You need to think about it during the day. You need to read it when you wake up. You need to read it when you go to sleep. You need to say it over and over. You need to do that for one year. And you need to be excited about it. You, it must be like a watermelon in the hot desert. Like you're dying of thirst and hunger. And somebody gives you a cold slice of watermelon. That's how you must be for that scripture. And when you eat it, it goes from your head into your heart. And then it uproots the fear. The word of God is the only thing that brings faith. And so the word of God is the only thing that can uproot fear in your life. And so a very good scripture for people that are having fear is God did not give me a spirit of fear, but of love, power, and a sound mind. That's a good scripture for you to meditate on. I know in my life, my own life. Many people don't know this. I was addicted to horror movies. I don't know why. I couldn't just couldn't stop watching it. And then I feel like I want to sleep with the light on. But let me tell you, in that season of my life, there was very little faith. In actual fact, I had none. And Satan had his way with me. I couldn't pray. My prayers were never answered. And the first thing that God did was remove the fear in my life. He told me, no more horror movies. Read the word of God. Read it out loud. Let's build some fear. You don't have a spirit of fear, but of love, power, and, and a sound mind. He made me confess that until fear left me. And only then was I able to start accessing the supernatural. I was able to pray and have my prayers answered. I was able to step into the supernatural using my faith. Your faith is the currency to buy things in heaven. If you walk into a supermarket, you need your wallet, your credit card, or you need money to purchase items in the store. They're not going to give it to you for free. You can have whatever you want in the store. You can pick and choose. You can buy everything in the store, provided that you have enough money. Well, in the supernatural, it's the same, but your faith is the currency. And so you can't purchase anything. You can't purchase a miracle from heaven. You can't purchase an experience with God. You, there's nothing that you can receive from heaven from the supernatural if you don't have faith because it's your currency that's why god says without faith it is impossible to please god because god wants you to have faith the bible even says god has given everybody a measure of faith and so we can't say we don't have faith or it can't work for us once we get rid of fear there has to be some faith in our lives but understand fear will cancel your faith fear will neutralize your faith i know many people that say oh i've got this phobia and this fear and they want to live with it and nurse it and rehearse it and look after it they don't understand that that thing in their life makes their faith very small and so for the season that we are going in now as jesus said 
If I return, will I find faith on the earth? Earth. We have to understand the devil is after our faith more than ever before. And so you need to have faith. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. We've got a lovely course on our platform called 2020-25 that will teach you how to cultivate faith and how to grow your faith. You can do that in your own time. Some people also don't understand that if you build up your faith, sin causes your faith to leak. And that's one of the requirements why you need to be holy. I know Christians today that are trapped in porn and they're so blasé about it, they're not even trying to hide it. It's like it's acceptable. I know 10 years ago, if somebody was trapped in porn, they would try to hide it. They would feel ashamed of it. But for the era that we are now in, <laughs> Christians aren't even ashamed of it anymore. In actual fact, the, 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 they share porn with other Christians. It's, it's shocking. Don't look or sound like the world. In other words, don't step into sin because faith will fear will neutralize your faith, but sin will cause it to leak. And so if you're trying to build yourself up on your most holy faith, if you're trying to increase your faith and enlarge your faith and get more faith, as soon as you involve yourself in sin, it's like punching a hole through the bucket that you just filled up. So imagine this bucket and, and, and you're pouring it to the brim. That's your faith that you're building, busy building it up. And you're not trying to carry this bucket on the way to a miracle, but it's got a hole and it's leaking. By the time that the miracle must manifest, the bucket is empty again. But that is what sin does. Said it, that is what sin does. It causes your faith to leak. And that is why we have to be holy. We have to be concentrated and set apart. We can't mix with sin or fear and think that we'll have faith or that a bucket won't leak. So it's very important. Sin causes your faith to leak. Hebrews 11.6 says, And without faith, it is impossible to please God. Unbelief is not that God cannot do it, but that God cannot do it for me. Many people say, I know God speaks, but he doesn't speak to me. Or I know God heals, but he won't heal me. Or I know God brings financial miracle, but he won't do it for me. That's unbelief. Unbelief. And so, Find the scripture that negates your unbelief or is the opposite of your own unbelief. So, for example, um, if you can't hear God because you have unbelief that you can hear God, uh, two good scriptures is my sheep know my voice and they follow me. And the sons of God are led by the spirit of God. And so put those two scriptures in your heart by meditating on it day and night. Here's a lovely scripture, Psalm 1-2. If the scripture is in your head, it won't produce faith. It needs to be in your heart. Your head produces facts. Your heart produces truth. Fact is, I have the flu. Truth is, I am healed. But the I am healed scripture will only produce, if I've meditated on it, to take it from my brain where there's facts, to put it in my heart where there's truth. And so Psalm 1-2 says, but those who delight but, uh, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on his law day and night. So there's the key. This is the foundation scripture that I used to create the Prophet Petrus one year scripture challenge. You take a scripture that's the opposite of your unbelief or the condition that you're in and you meditate on it day and night. You say it, you rehearse it. You memorize it, you repeat it, you read it. When you wake up in the morning, you eat that scripture and you'll be glad about it. At lunchtime, you read it again before you eat. You even eat, you even read the scripture before dinner time. You read it again before you go to bed and you do that for a year, day and night. Why? Before you go to sleep. Because what you do 15 minutes before you go to sleep translates into your dream life. Try it. If you read that scripture, just before you go to bed every night, then you are not meditating on it just during the day. You're meditating on it at, at, at night as well. And so it is important that you renew your mind by meditating on the scripture long enough, reading it, repeating it, memorizing it, saying it, becoming excited about it, so that it goes into your heart, into your heart. And then 
There's something called total immersion. What is that? During World War II, when Germany was trying to take over the whole world under Hitler, there were spies that had to act as Germans. But the problem is, if you don't know the language, obviously you're going to be caught out. Or if you speak with an accent, you're going to be found out. So what did they do during the war? To plant spies that they're not caught. They trained them in such a way that they sounded like a native German. And how did they do that? With total immersion. They would build a house. And so everybody that needs to learn to speak German would go to, they would stay in one of these houses. And surrounded by people that spoke German, the TV was German, the radio was German, the labels was German, the toothpaste, everything was German. And so you would live in this house and only speak and see and hear and read German. It's called total immersion. For example, somebody was English, an English spy would be put in to this house where it's total immersion. There would be other housemates that live in the house, but uh, there's only German. There's magazines, it's in German. There's radio, it's in German. There's TV, it's in German. Everything is in German. What happens? You learn faster. And so instead of learning a language over a period of time and, and, and taking a long time to learn the accent, it happened in weeks and months. And so if you don't have faith, why don't you do total immersion with the word of God? I know when I became born again, God put such a hunger in me for the word, for a season, that I was just consuming the word. I couldn't get enough. I, re I read through the entire Bible um, in about a month or two. I also listened to the audio Bible. I got through the audio Bible on top of my own reading, also through a month or two. And, and I repeated that pattern for the first year. And, and it became a foundation in my life. It started sinking in. I started understanding the word of God and the structure and the context and things stood out for me. And I started recognizing patterns. The Holy Spirit quickened my memory, but I had to immerse myself. Still today, I'm standing on my total Im immersion experience that I had. And so I would encourage you, when you do it like that, it becomes the foundation of your life. You need to read the word out loud. It causes 100% of your brain to be active instead of 20% of your brain when you read it softly, uh, when we read it silently in your head. <clears throat> Science proves that when you read it out loud, because of the feedback loop, your, your eyes read it, so your brain interprets the words that you read, then your brain sends the interpreted words to, to your voice box so that you can speak it, then your ears hear the words that you've spoken, and it gives the words back that you speak back to the words that you read to see if it matches. It's called a feedback loop. Because of that feedback loop, your brain is engaged 100% of the time. But if you're not doing the feedback loop, your brain is only engaged 20% of the time. So what does that mean? When your brain is focused on what it's doing, it's like meditating. And science can prove now that when you read out loud, you remember more than when you just read silently in your head. And science also proves auditory retention is better than visual retention. What does that mean? How many of you read a page in a book and then you only once and then you can't remember it anymore? But you had a half an hour conversation with a friend and you remember almost everything. The conversation with your friend was audible and we are wired to memorize auditory input. But the visual aspect, reading the page was not. And so science proves we retain more when we listen to something than when we have to read it. So why don't you try reading the word out loud so that you can engage your brain 100% and so that you can, because of the auditory retention, retain more of what you've read. You need to grow and mature, learn God's way. This is the archie for a lot of us. Paul talks about the milk and then the meat. So obviously we start our Christian walk as babies, but then we need to grow. Now this is the catch. God is not going to make you grow. <laughs> you are responsible for your own character development. And so does God shock you awake at 6 a.m. for you to read the word? No. Does God shock you at 7 a.m. after you've read the word for an hour to pray in tongues. No. The problem is 
you are in control. And so it's up to you. Are you going to grow and mature or are you going to stay the same? When you are stagnant, staying the same, it's not a progressive journey forward. The problem is then that you are actually backsliding. If you are not progressing, if you are stagnant or going back, you are backsliding. And so don't expect to keep your salvation. Don't, don't, don't expect for you to go to heaven. Don't expect for you to stand against the enemy. You need to mature. You need to grow. And it's your responsibility. It's your responsibility. How do you do that? Part of, part of doing that is learning God's ways. I'll, I'll, I'll give this illustration. Many of you have heard it before. If you want to build a relationship with your neighbor, you are going to observe him. So you're going to watch him carefully so that you can learn his patterns and his likes and his dislikes. You're going to watch him carefully so that you can figure out what does he do and what does he like and what does he not like. A man pursuing a woman for the first time that he wants to date or marry will know this very well. He becomes infatuated. His brain turns to mush. He'll know her favorite color, her birthday, her favorite song, the perfume she wears, the address that she stays, what's the telephone number, and he'll have all these facts and interesting things about her because he's trying to impress her and trying to woo her. We need to be like that with God. And when you learn what that person likes or doesn't like, you're not going to do something that they don't want. For example, if the neighbor hates cats and he loves cycling, you're not going to buy him a cat for his birthday. You're probably going to buy a bike so that you can go cycle with him. Well, if you don't understand God's ways, then you are transgressing. You're doing things that he doesn't like. Now, if you buy the neighbor a cat, do you really think he's going to want intimacy with you? He's going to want a relationship. He's going to invite you for a barbecue, cry for the South African friends. No, he's not going to do that. He's going to say to you, please never speak to me again. It's the same with God. God wants intimacy and he wants us to learn his ways. And so it is our responsibility to learn the rules and the regulations of that relationship of what God wants and doesn't want and likes and doesn't like in the word. 2 Timothy 2.15 says, study to show yourself approved. Apply the word, James 1.22, but the, be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourself. If you're not a doer of the world, word, you're not learning God's ways and you're not showing him that you are doing everything that is attracting him. And so you need to make yourself attractive to God. The Bible says the aroma, the aroma of your heart. So it produces a smell. Some of the smell could be pleasing or, or repulsive. And so learn God's ways and then do it. So we have to do Proverbs 12, 1. We learn his ways. But then we have to do James 1.22. We apply what we've learned. If I figure out the neighbor doesn't like cats, but he likes cycling, and I do nothing about it, he will never have a relationship with me. Right? So if I know he likes cycling, and I start cycling, then we're going to be cycling together. But it's the same in the word. I don't know why we make this so complicated. We figure out in the word what we must do, but then we still only hear us. We, we, we spectate us. Well, you have to do the doing. You have to go into action. You have to start doing the word, and that way you'll be attracting God. You'll be showing God, I'm learning your ways. I'm discovering more of you. I'm pursuing you. I want deeper intimacy with you. And the Bible says, draw near to me, and I will draw near to you. So, when we start drawing near to God by learning his ways and doing his ways, he will start drawing near to us. And so how to accelerate growth? God is trying to teach us. And every time we do not listen or obey, it causes a delay because he has to repeat the lesson at a high level. Many people don't understand this. Let me put it this way. If somebody was meant to be a millionaire, do they start off as a millionaire businessman? Do they start off at age two with a millionaire mindset and a millionaire attitude and a millionaire's discipline and they just have a, a business that produces a million rand a month? 
No, you have to grow. And so we call that school fees. So maybe this person finishes primary school and secondary and, and uh, high school, secondary ter uh, tertiary education. Um, maybe they don't go to university. That's okay. You don't have to do that to be a millionaire. And they start off to be a businessman. And maybe in year one, they have no accountability regarding the finances in the company and they go bankrupt because they, they, they're spending, living a lifestyle beyond their means. They're just spending, spending, spending because the money's coming in now. And so at the end of year one, the company goes bankrupt. That's a lesson that you have to learn because you have to learn to work, learn to work with money. If you don't learn that lesson that year, you're going to have to have a repeat of that experience. So the following year, you didn't put accountability and an accountant to handle the money in place and you eat all the money again, again you go bankrupt. And so that's going to continue until you've learned that lesson. Then you can pass on to the next lesson. So maybe this clever businessman learns that lesson the first time because it was a lot of pain. So here's another key. If there's no pain, often we don't learn. It's called school fees. And so God will teach you on a level where the price that you pay is a little bit so that he's got your attention. And if you don't learn the lesson, you'll repeat it at a higher level where it costs you more, where it costs you more. Why? Because he wants you to learn and because it's causing delay and it's, it's causing you to go back. And so if the businessman learns the first year, the next year, maybe there's a new lesson. He partners with the wrong person and his partner puts his hand in the cookie jar and runs away with all the money. And so he has to learn that too. And so like the businessman may need to learn 10 good lessons before he becomes a good steward of wealth and before he knows how to run his business so that he can become a millionaire. We also have to grow through learning lessons. Now, how do you accelerate that growth? By not being stubborn when the lesson is being taught. True. So that you learn the first time so that God doesn't have to repeat the lesson at a high level. And you might say, no, I do everything great. I've learned all my lessons. My challenge to you is, are you tithing? Are you tithing on every paycheck? Are you sowing from every paycheck? Well, that's the first rung in obedience. But we want to say, no, God doesn't have to repeat the lesson. We've learned everything. This is how you can accelerate growth. When God is trying to teach you something, to obey and listen the first time. To obey and listen the first time. So that he does not have to repeat the lesson at a higher level. If you failed matric, you don't get to have a rewrite. If you fail uh, uh, your year-end exam in school for the American friends, we call it matric, you call it grade 12. We also now call it grade 12 for the new government. If you fail a year in school, you have to repeat it. So you've wasted another year. With God, it is the same. It's the same. And so when God is trying to teach you something, if you are quick to listen and obey, there's no delay. And there's less pain to you. I don't know about you, but I like comfort. I don't like storms. I don't like difficulty. My flesh is very happy just to coast along and have it easy. And so... If God has to repeat the lesson, I'm going to pay a bigger price because he's trying to get my attention. I don't want to pay a bigger price. And if God has to repeat the lesson, I have to do that year over again, like in school when I failed school for that year. And so that's delay. I, I don't want to have delay. And so we have to learn to pay attention and to listen and obey quickly so that God doesn't have to repeat the lesson at a high level where it'll cost us more and will also cost us more time. Humble yourself through fasting. Ouch! <laughs> it blows my mind how Christians try to wriggle out of this one. Some people tell me, Prophet Petrus, I will only fast if Jesus comes and tells me face to face <laughs> that I must fast. You know, there's a fasting movement around the earth inspired by the Holy Spirit to be a, to, uh, for a quickening to fulfill the Joel 2.12 prophecy 
of the two greatest blessings for for christians to step into the two greatest blessings in the darkest most perilous times of mankind but the key to step into that is through fasting and to quicken and awaken and reawaken people to fasting the holy spirit has started to move around the earth but unfortunately worldly people are on this bandit wagon and christians are not True. they jump off kicking and screaming you can't even drag them into it psalms 35 15 i put on sackcloth and humble myself with fasting moses was the most humble man in all the world and he even wrote that scripture about himself <laughs> it doesn't sound very humble <laughs> but that is what happens when you fast to deny yourself something is telling god i submit to you, uh, i submit unto you i submit unto you I, I subjugate, put under, suppress, make weak my flesh while I strengthen my spirit at the same time. And, and I acknowledge my sinful nature. That is what happens when you fast. And so ask Christians to fast 21 days without eating food or drinking anything except water and they'll want to stone you. But there are people in the world that are even completing 60 days fasting with water because of the benefit that it brings I, I know that's uncommon not a lot of people in the world fast that long but they are hungry they do 40 days no problem and so why is it that a christian cannot fast because we've made it an idol yeah. because of our pride we don't want to because god said jesus jesus spoke and said uh, what happened was John's disciples came and accused Jesus' disciples. Why are you not fasting? And then Jesus said, how can they fast? The bridegroom is here. And then he said, but when the bridegroom is gone, they will fast. Yeah. And let me tell you, the Daniel fast is not a fast. The ones about fruit and vegetables. First of all, Daniel did a diet for 10 days to eat fruit and vegetables only because he didn't want to defile himself by eating the king's food, which contained pork and cloven hoofed animals and other things that were not clean. So David was uh, Daniel. Daniel was tested for 10 days eating fruit and vegetables. And then in the book of Daniel, it says his overseer continued to feed him like that. So Daniel was a vegan. <laughs> it was not a fast. So as Christians, and it's also a half fast. In other words, it's not a proper fast. I mean, half out is out not in half out is out you know on the uh, over the line is out and uh, a half fast is not a fast and christians are fasting with fruit and vegetables eating better on the fruit and vegetable fast than when they not fasting david said i will not sacrifice the lord my god unless it cost me something a fast is a sacrifice. Where's the cost that you are paying? Fasting is a great phenomenal tool that you can humble yourself. We have a phenomenal workshop on it. If you haven't done it, if you want to step into the greatest blessing of all time, don't take my word for it. Go watch the course. If you want to learn how you can heal your body, if you want to learn any disease, any sickness can be reversed. Diabetes, cancer, uh, eyes can be restored we know a lady that she she was wearing glasses and after her fast she didn't need glasses anymore so she stopped and she had a debilitating eye disease that she should have gone blind yeah. over time mm -hmm. and fasting stopped it and restored her sight mm -hmm. the doctor cannot believe it she's supposed to have this debilitating sickness in her eyes every year it gets worse and worse until she goes blind well fasting reversed it if you want to find out how to humble yourself and how to engage God that he speaks to you face to face and for you to heal your body, but also step into the greatest blessing ever pronounced in the Bible. We encourage you to do the fasting workshop on Coursely. It's phenomenal. 15 years of research, you'll be blown away. We haven't had one person that did that course that's, that told us it was a mistake. Recently, a pastor invited us to go minister our workshop at his church. And he said to me, I want to warn you, this is a fasting church. We know everything about fasting. Yeah. Everybody has, yeah, has every book on fasting. We've done many workshops on fasting. We often invite people. We're at the point now, if you're not engaging, 
we might stone you because we know everything about everything on fasting. That wasn't very encouraging. I, I was like, must I go and minister here? Must I duck and run? Do they really want to hear what I have to say? What am I going to teach them? And the people were very skeptical. You know, when you're a presenter in the room, you know, if you do it frequently enough, you know how to read the room. The people were hostile. Their hearts were closed. They were not open to what I had to hear. And they were, and the temperature in the room said, you're wasting my time, but my pastor forced me to be here. <laughs> At the end of that course, every single person came to me and said, I thought I understood fasting. And then I realized I know nothing. True. That's right. And I learned from your course more than in 10, 20 years of doing fasting and fasting workshops and fasting books. In one day, I learned more than that 20 years put together. Absolutely. And I just want to tell you, hey, I didn't write it. I just put down what God told me to, to give you. And so it's not my glory. It's not my intellect. It's not my achievement. It's straight from the throne room of God. And so if you've never done the fasting workshop, I dare you. Why don't you just go and, and do it and see what is it about? Is it for you or not? Or are you learning anything? Everybody that does the fasting workshop tells me it's changed my life. I wish the church was teaching this 10, 20, 30 years ago already so that it could have been a foundation in my life. So that's available on Coursely. And we've come to the end. Thank you for watching.